And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, then shall the end come. The educational system today, as you know as well as I do, is one of the worst places in the world for a young child to be placed, but that's where they go, and the government puts its demand on your children that they be trained and educated by their system. My, my message tonight, a strong delusion are given over to the flesh. I'm going to read from 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 11 and 12. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they might all be damned who believe not the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. Now the disciples are asking Jesus, tell us, when are you coming back and what will it be like at the end of the world? A very, very specific question. Now, Jesus gives a very clear answer for those who want to hear it. He describes the end of time as a season of great confusion and calamity in the world. In spite of what some might be saying, there is a confusion and a calamity coming. It's going to encompass the whole world. And if we believe the words of Isaiah, it's going to happen very suddenly. One of the Old Testament prophets says it'll happen at a time when they're saying peace and safety, perhaps a peace treaty signed finally in Israel and all the world will breathe including Israel this sigh of relief which will be extremely short-lived the internet we have a web page but folks the internet is full of filth it's full of godlessness the internet is a horrible place if you just get on there and not know where you're going I've said it a thousand times probably a hundred in this church that I can describe Pentecost in one line God the Father, through God the Holy Ghost, displaying God the Son through a vehicle called the church. For that reason, Pentecost was given, that Christ may be real. Now, express, to express Christ, who is truth, the church must become the truth that she is to express. Not just a knowledge of something, but actually becoming the truth that God has called her to be. Every time God called a man in the Bible, and since God never changes, it always remains the same. He began immediately to make that man, that woman, that people, the message that they preached. Not enough for us to say words. We must be what we are preaching. That is the key to it all. Now, therefore, from her birth to her rapture, there must be the, this continuing moving toward the image of Christ. That the purpose of the church to be fulfilled, that must be ever the progress of the church. There, this can only be accomplished as we behold him in the spirit. The imperativeness of the Holy Spirit has been lost in our time. This is not an optional thing. It is as imperative that born-again believers be filled with the Holy Ghost as it is for unregenerate people to be born again. Impossible to fulfill the mission of Christ apart from the Holy Ghost. It's as we behold Him in the Spirit that this transformation is taking place in our lives. Jesus tells us that religious deception will increasingly abound in the last days. 
He says, many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now, there's two ways of seeing this. First of all, there are those who come on the scene and declare themselves to be the Messiah. They should be fairly easy to spot as frauds. But then there's others, and I do believe this is the deeper context of this verse, that there will be those who stand in pulpits or on television or through the media in some manner, and they will say, listen, to look at me, you're looking at Christ. Because, you see, everyone knows that Christ indwells a body, and that his life becomes the life of his church. And there will be those who stand saying, in effect, if you're looking at my life, you're looking at Christ. You're looking at what Christ can do. They'll come, he said, in my name, saying, I am Christ. But you see, they'll be everything and anything but Christ. Most of what you process in your mind today is simply anti-Christ in nature. So what is your escape? What is your refuge? What is your fortress? How do you get away from all of this? What do you, what do you raise up as a standard against it when it comes against you? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's called the sword of the Spirit. Yeah. Immediately when you think of a sword, you think of something that is a weapon. A sword's not a toy, folks. It's a weapon. And the sword of the Spirit... The Bible said in Ephesians 6.17 is the Word of God. This Bible is a sharp two-edged sword. It is two-edged. The Bible said in Revelation 1.16 that it is a two-edged sword. In Hebrews chapter number 4 and verse 12, the Scripture says the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the... I don't know of anything else that can do that. The Bible, the Bible tells you that it can read your mind. It can read your heart and it can separate you down to your lowest element. Now once the Bible is done with you, there's nothing hidden. For the scripture can open you up like nothing else can. But it also in Revelation chapter number 19 verse 15, it cuts to the intended target. It is a two-edged sword. Not only does it speak to you, but my friend, it also applies to that one who's coming against you. It is your weapon against the enemy. And make no mistake about it, he is a malevolent enemy. He comes to destroy you, to kill and to steal and to destroy. Satan is a liar. From the very beginning, he's a murderer. And he has no good intent for you whatsoever. He can deceive you into thinking that he is beneficial, that he's good, that what you're doing is helpful, that it's, a, it's approved. But in the end, it biteth like a serpent. It will destroy your very life. Satan, my friend, is a lion. So the Bible says the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit, and that is what you absolutely must use against the enemy. The Word of God has authority. In the book of Genesis chapter number 1 and verse 3, and God said, let there be. Only the words proceeding forth from His mouth was necessary to bring into existence what men are still clamoring today to discover. God made it all by saying, let there be. If the Almighty could speak the universe into existence and yet take time to form you from the dust of the ground that tells me that you're far more important to God than a star out here somewhere at the end of some galaxy. He knows every tick of your heart Every movement of your brain, every breath you breathe, every thought that goes through your mind, everything about your being. The Almighty has made provision for you because you're far more important to Him than some nebula, some space, some star, some planet, some whatever out there. It makes no difference. He made the stars also. That's as far as God's concerned. That's all that matters to Him. It's nothing but endless nothing. What matters is the soul of a human being. We, we, we've lost sight of the path and we're trying to invent new ways into that image. But let me remind you of the journey of Jesus to that immortal triumph. Remember the garden where he sweat blood. Remember Pilate's hall where they put on him a purple robe and smote him. Remember the experience with his closest disciples as they all forsook him and fled. Remember how they nailed him to a cross. Those six awful hours, the hiding of the Father's face. Remember the darkness. Remember the surrender of his spirit in death. This was a path 
that Jesus took to immortal triumph and everlasting glory. And as he is in this world, so are we. Now in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 11, Jesus defines the truths of the kingdom as mysteries that are hidden from those who have no heart to know them. Nothing has changed about his word. It is the same word today that it was 2,000 years ago. It is God Almighty's declaration to man, and it is loaded with power. But the unleashing of that power is the key to the victorious Christian life. It is to know how to approach Scripture and your enemy, the devil. It is to know how to deal with these issues that we must, that we must focus today in the Scripture, the Word of God. The Bible says the sword of the Spirit is God's provision for the believer. You use it against your enemy, not flesh and blood. The battle is a spiritual battle. Therefore, the concept of Scripture, the message of the Bible, the thought of the Scripture, all of the nuances in the Bible that sometimes aren't readily apparent, but it's loaded with meaning, are for the spirit of a man. You get the spirit of a man right, everything else yeah. will fall in its place. It's not always going to be easy, is what I'm telling you. This pathway is not always the pathway of the least resistance. There's a devil out there, and it's a foolish theology that makes you believe you can tiptoe around him. The desert's not a thousand miles off your pathway. It's straight ahead. You just keep a walking. The sand's going to burn your feet somewhere out there. If you walk with God, you're going to have to face the devil. Jesus talks about the parable of the sower. And in verse 19, he says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom. Now, he, he, he talks about the seed that the sower is sowing as the word of the kingdom. The kingdom of God has a word. This, this word is given to men and it's given for the purpose of producing, first of all, salvation, obviously, but secondarily, the fruit of God in a people called the church of Jesus Christ. And if you go through the teaching of the word of the kingdom, Jesus taught that unbelief, the inability to understand or endure trial and persecution and greed would leave many outside of his kingdom. In the book of Ephesians, chapter number 6, the Bible talks about the armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, your loins girt about, and all of these other things in the shield of truth. But it also talks about the sword of the Spirit in Ephesians, chapter number 6. The sword of the Spirit, therefore, is drawn to our attention because it is the one part of this panoply of defense that you have in Ephesians 6 that is different from all the rest. Because everything that is mentioned in Ephesians 6 is for defense except the sword. The sword undoubtedly is a defensive weapon. You can defend yourself with a sword and make no mistake about it. But primarily a sword is a striking weapon, a thrusting weapon. It is designed to kill the enemy. And you've got to keep that in mind. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, therefore is given into your hand to know how to assault that one who wants to destroy you. The dark ages were the results of that church born at Pentecost turning from the leadership of the Holy Spirit to the scheming, dark and carnal mind. That's what brought about the dark ages and as sure as you live, they'll repeat themselves when that church becomes other than what God intended. The word would be preached to different types of people. There are those who just the word would be just so outside of their context of what they're willing to give to God that they simply can't understand it. The enemy comes immediately, plucks it out of their heart and takes it away and they go on their way in their own deceptive view of God or their own deceptive religion. He talks about others who receive with joy but they, they don't understand that to embrace Christ in his fullness means that you are now standing face first into a hurricane of a society that is in rebellion against God. And Jesus said, if they called me Beelzebub, how much more are they going to call those of my house, those who are walking with me, those who identify with me. And see, many people come to Christ under a gospel message that doesn't clearly define this, doesn't tell people, you're going to run in smack into trouble. You're not going to be loved when you come to God. When you start doing right, when you start speaking truth in the midst of a lying environment, when you start doing 
things that are honest when people around you are dishonest and crooked, when you start speaking well of people when everyone else is tearing them down, when you start doing right, you start living right, you start thinking right, a world that's headlong going into rebellion against God is not going to love you. You're going to come into trial and persecution. And he says there are people who just received the word. They're receiving at least part of it. They want to go to heaven. They want to be saved. This is, they, are, they hear perhaps that Christ opens prison doors, sets people free, gives people a new mind and a new heart. And they say, I want that part. That's a good part. I want that part. But when persecution arises because they begin to live for God, Jesus said they're offended. I didn't really sign up for this. I signed up for a good life. I signed up to be prosperous and healthy and happy and to be free from all the oppression of the enemy. I didn't sign up to be persecuted and despised and hated. And so they're offended. And whatever had found a place in their heart quickly dissipates and they can no longer hear his word. Instead of appealing to your emotions and your intellect and your mind and your ability and what you've accomplished in your life, instead of that you turn to the sword of the Spirit, the word of the living God. It is therefore beneficial to you and to me and to every human being on this earth that the more of the word of God that you've memorized, the more of it that you've hidden in the heart, the more of it that becomes part of your nature, the better equipped you are for the battle that rages around your soul. There is a war, folks. I'm not talking about a skirmish. There is a war going on right now for the souls of men. And the battlefield is the mind. And to know how to deal with this issue is to know how to deal with Satan and to know how to deal with the spiritual forces that are arrayed against you. And make no mistake, they know what they're doing. Do we know what we're doing? They know what their end is. Do you know what your end is? They know who their captain is. Do you know who your captain is? They know where they're going. Do you know where you're going? It is a battle to the death. It's not a game. It's not a joke. They're not playing. They will fight you to the very death. And they have no mercy. They know not mercy. They know nothing about mercy. When they get to your jugular, they'll cut you down and destroy you. I've watched men die like that. I've watched them throw their life and their family away and then look at themselves in a mirror and say when it's too late, what a fool I've been. So the sword of the spirit, the tactics, my friend, therefore are to kill. Truth to be understood must be lived. It's impossible for you to understand truth without living it. That Bible doctrine is wholly ineffective until digested and assimilated. Jonathan Edwards preached the message, sinners in the hands of an angry God, 100 times before it broke that congregation and brought revival. It must be assimilated and digested. It must become what I am if it's going to affect our world. And then their last category of people are just, Jesus said, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. They, they, they receive the word of God for a moment, but they're, they're moved back into what they had left behind. And their security goes back to the things of this world and the things of this earth. And they even enter into certain forms of religion, even in God's name, that draw them back into places where they lose the seed of God that was planted in their hearts. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Notice it didn't come that he might temper the works of the devil, that he might make them null and void. No, he came to destroy the works of the devil. The essence of my belief is there's a difference, a vast difference between fact and truth. Truth in scripture is more than fact. A fact may be detached, impersonal, cold, totally disassociated from life. Truth on the other hand, is war living spiritual a theological a theological fact may be held in the mind for a lifetime without it having any positive effect upon the moral character but truth is creative save it transform it it always changes the one who receives it into a humbler more more uh, a holier man not facts, 
not scientific knowledge, but eternal truth. Truth delivers man. And the eternal truth became flesh to dwell among us. This is life eternal that they may know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent.